Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, November 14th, 2019 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm uh, Mayor David Narkowitz, the chair of the committee, and I'll begin the meeting by asking the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Mayor David Narkowitz. Present. Mr. Present. Ms. Laura Fallon. Present. Present. Mr. Danny Meyer. Here. Mr. Howard Moore. Here. Ms. Susan Voss. Present. Your Honor, you have a quorum. Thank you very much. And I just want to let the public know that this meeting is being video and audio recorded by Northampton Open Media. Um, we'll begin this evening with the public comment period. Um, there's um, actually no one has signed up for the public comment period, but is there anyone who wishes to speak in public comment? Going once, going twice, okay. So there's no public comment this evening. Are there any announcements from members of the school committee? Okay, Ms. Sorry, Fox. I get my notes out first. No problem. Excuse me. Um, on Tuesday night, the CPAC, the Special Ed Parent Advisory Committee met, and I'm the representative, and I just wanted to make a few announcements regarding the work there. So um, on Tuesday, January 14th, the CPAC is going to have a listening session for the community at JFK at 6.30 p.m. with Dr. Provost and student service administrators, um, which would include Dr. Plummer, Josh Dixon, and Dave. Um, and this is a listening session, but families can um, should come and just share their experiences and ask questions. It's somewhat informal and uh, time to have a conversation. And then um, I, I guess they, they said consider it as much as a listening session and a meet and greet. Um, and last night, or Tuesday night at the meeting, there was a really great discussion about flex block at the high school and its relationship, or, or I, maybe we call it block X block now, which is gonna potentially go in um, to the schedule next year and its relationship with the block schedule. Um, and that's my announcement. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there any other announcements? Ms. Fallon. Um, so I just wanted to update the committee. Since we met last, um, uh, there's been a meeting of the MIA Basketball Committee and of the MIAC, the Massachusetts Interscholastic Athletic um, Council that I'm now a member of. Um, and one of the things that has been a big issue for the last year is the move towards um, a statewide tournament in all 16 sports in the Commonwealth. Um, this has been shared widely um, with um, administrators, superintendents, athletic directors, and coaches, but I don't think that the message has gotten to parents and school committee members for feedback. Um, so I wanted to kind of give you the heads up that I think that they've been very receptive to the feedback that they've gotten about the program. They would be using um, Max Preps to put in all of the data and it would allow for better seedings and um, more equitable pairings throughout the statewide tournament. Um, the one issue is the school committee member that I've brought up at both meetings has been um, in the spring I asked them to please run us an example of what would this look like and for the most part it actually does work out that you know in the western part of the state we're mostly playing teams in the central and western part of the state and the eastern part are playing eastern. However, what concerns me are the anomalies. For example, you have a matchup with Dennis Yarmouth and Pittsfield. Um, we're talking a four-hour bus ride under the best of conditions. Um, and so I was concerned about student lost time on learning, about um, unanticipated expense of busing, um, and if you're talking about multiple sports and multiple postseason play that you haven't budgeted for. Um, I had suggested that maybe there would be a trigger mechanism for those, for those matchups that were truly that geographically distant that um, perhaps they could be played in a neutral location um, in a somewhere closer together um, and that was not well received but I also suggested um, that perhaps we make allowances for those games to be played on weekends um, for a lot of athletes that you know this is postseason play this may be the last game they ever play to have a parent have to take off from work to drive four hours to see their child play their last high school game you know is a little bit too much to ask um, the same thing fans you wouldn't expect a fan bus of you know students to miss four or five hours of school to get to a sporting event 
um, and that was well received. So they are looking for ways around that. The other notion um, that I had suggested was if you know the home team is the one that would typically get the revenue, but it would be the visiting team that's paying the expenses for a bus to go that far, um, and the idea of maybe revenue sharing, um, sharing the gate receipts to offset the cost of busing or some sort of kind of pothole account. Um, so they've been receptive to those ideas, but I feel like sometimes as the only MASC rep at in these committee meetings um, that I'm sort of decision making in a vacuum. So if anyone has feedback, questions, concerns, um, the vote could come as early as our next meeting in January. So I'd love to hear from you about that. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to update you on is the MASC conference that uh, I attended. It was Wednesday through Saturday last week. Um, I know that a couple of you have been. and. It's kind of hit or miss which year is really worth it and other years, you know, you're not as sure that it was, a, you know, worth your time. Um, and this was one of the years that was truly amazing. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but I was able to attend kind of nuts and bolts sessions, like double sessions on parliamentary procedure and superintendent evaluation. Um, and then other things like organizing your district resources, using data to look at how you could reallocate limited resources to better reflect your priorities. Um, and that was really interesting. Um, and then the keynote speaker was absolutely fantastic. Um, Dr. Derek Gay um, had a, um, a program titled Reframing Diversity for the 21st Century that was absolutely phenomenal, I think Dr. Provost would agree. Um, and so I just wanted to say if you get the MASC app, most of the materials or many of the materials are available to you guys so you can see what was offered, all the supporting materials, the PowerPoints. Um, and as far as the resolutions, um, all of them passed, not necessarily in the form that we saw them. Many of them were amended. Um, those are now available as of yesterday on the MASC website if you guys wanted to check in and see what the results of the Delegate Assembly votes were. So that's it. Okay, thank you for that. Thanks. Any other announcements? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next we have a series of recommended actions as part of our consent agenda. Um, we have the approval of minutes of the school committee uh, meetings of September 12th and October 10th. Um, and then we have two field trip approvals. Um, we have uh, JFK uh, Latin uh, going to New York City on May 12th, uh, 2020, and the JFK Spanish trip going to New York City on May 12th, 2020. Um, and I would entertain a motion to accept the consent agenda. A motion to accept. Okay. And is there a second? Second. Okay. And can I, I have a question on the minutes. Um, I can't remember, can, is there, am um, I allowed to? You can to just ask to remove yeah. uh, the minutes. Which minutes would you like to the, remove? Uh, the 12th or the 10th? Um, the 12th. Okay, so um, Ms. Burnham will ask us to remove the minutes of September 12th from the consent agenda. Are there any other questions about the consent agenda? Okay, so then the, um, the motion to approve the consent agenda would be everything except those minutes of uh, September 12th. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, any abstentions? Okay, so now um, I would turn to uh, Ms. Burnham to um, um, actually, if you would make a motion on the September 12th uh, minutes and then with whatever. Um, okay, I, I just, I had a question on a word. Okay. In it, um, okay. which was in the middle school math pilot update and discussion. Um, there's a sentence, it is a fee web resource in the middle of that paragraph with fees for professional development. And I was confused about, I thought it should be free, right? That's what I thought. Okay. So I just wanted to clarify that. It's in, it's on G, yep, G. It's the, uh, let's see. X, I think. One, two, three, four. It's about six sentences down from the top. There's a, before it, it says alignment, assessment, assignments, equity, access, and instructional technology integration, period. It is a fee web resource, oh, okay. and it just is supposed to be free. Thanks. Thank you. Sure. So could you make a motion to approve with that correction? Yeah. Make a motion to approve with the correction of changing the word fee to free. Second. Okay. Second. Any other uh, discussion about those minutes? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstention? Okay, so those uh, minutes of May 12th as amended are, I'm um, sorry, of September 12th are approved. Everything's the 12th. Um, 
Okay, so now we'll move to reports and recommendations and we'll turn to our student representative, Eleanor Harden, for the student representative report. Hello, um, I guess I'll just get right into it. So this morning, um, me and another member of the school, all right, the student union, um, Izzy Donnelly, had a meeting with Dr. Provost and the administration at NHS to talk about um, a survey that we recently have distributed and analyzed the results from um, about changing the school start times. Um, uh, we had talked about this last meeting, how we, you, um, we wanted to, to get student feedback. Um, and so we were able to put out a survey um, because Izzy happened to have a project in his AP stats class um, that required him to do a survey. And so um, it kind of worked out. Um, but anyways, we discussed that the results from that survey um, and just the survey in general with Dr. Provost and the administration this morning. Um, and we've decided that there are a few minor changes that we want to make to the survey. Um, and that we would like to redistribute it to a greater population of the school. We'd like to distribute it to the entire school. Um, we only distributed it to four different English classes. Um, about 85 students received and took the survey. Um, so I think we decided that we wanted to, to distribute it to a broader, uh, to the entire school. Um, and yeah, overall the results from this kind of preliminary survey that we just distributed were that um, the majority of students um, really supported changing the school start times to a later time um, and they were able to kind of um, explain why they were in support of this, this change or were not in support of it. Um, so yeah, hopefully by um, the next meeting or the next couple of meetings we'll be able to kind of give you guys a more detailed report of what that says. Um, and then let's see, um, at our school, at our student union meeting yesterday we just attended the um, principal search forum which was really um, informative and we really enjoyed going to that. Um, we're also continuing to make progress on our sex ed curriculum project that we've been working on since last year. Um, and so the two members of the union that are working on that project recently met with um, one of the wellness teachers and have agreed to distribute a survey um, to each of the wellness classes to um, kind of gauge how uh, consistent the material they're learning is. Um, and so hopefully that will be distributed soon. Um, we're also planning on distributing another survey. Um, that's, we are, we'd like to kind of keep consistent at the beginning of every year. The student union is planning on distributing a survey similar to this one. We did one last year um, and we're just planning to use it to gauge kind of the opinion that students have on different issues within our school, um, the ones that, you know, what they want us to be focusing on and also their opinion on uh, what we are currently focusing on. Um, and so that's being distributed. Um, I think it, some were distributed today, tomorrow, and the beginning of next week. So we'll be able to uh, look at that information uh, soon. And I think that's kind of a some of what we've been doing as a union. Some school events updates. Um, Romeo and Juliet the play open tonight, so that's really exciting. Uh, the Powder Puff football game was last night, and the seniors won, so that's also really exciting as I'm a senior. Um, but yeah, that's about it. All right, so thank you. Thank you so much, Eleanor, for that report. Um, Next, we have a uh, discussion and vote um, to approve the Collaborative for Educational Services membership uh, for Gateway Regional and Worthington Public Schools. Um, and we're joined tonight by um, the Collaborative Executive Director, Bill Deal, who's going to make a quick presentation to us. Thank you very much for giving me some time. I want to first of all make sure I point out that our new deputy director is with me tonight, Karen Reuter. 
um, has a strong background in education, and she's administration, principalship, superintendent, and she's really, she's just started recently, and has in her portfolio in supporting all our direct service programs, and has already made a big difference in the work that we do. So I want to make sure you meet her. Um, the second thing I do want to do is make sure I recognize uh, your very able uh, representative to our board, our um, wonderful representative, very strong, helps our board a great deal. Last night was part of a lot of discussions we had. And next to her is Howard Moore, your former representative, also a very wonderful and able representative. Thank you to the mayor and to Superintendent Provost. We have been colleagues and collaborators and thought partners and we worked together on letting illustrators know about education in the Pioneer Valley. So I really appreciate the, the connections we've had. So I've been going around to uh, 36 school districts, roughly. Some of them meet simultaneously. So I'm going to a lot of school districts. And I always appreciate sitting, standing in front of the school committee. They're all different, all different backgrounds. I'm always overdressed. Um, <laughs> But they go from very rural districts into you know some more sophisticated districts like North Hampton. Um, and I'm always struck by and really kind of moved by the fact that I'm standing in front of volunteers, people who volunteer, they run for office, they volunteer their time through thick and thin, through the mundane and the exciting um, on behalf of the kids of the community. So I don't think you get enough credit, so let me give you some credit for myself for your service to, to the kids of Northampton. Really appreciate it. So what I want to do is spend a few minutes talking about the collaborative itself, a few minutes talking about what we do with Northampton as a collaborative, and then turn to the board about the arts and the That's okay. So I have some things in your folders. I did a folder so I could go through relatively quickly. Those of you who don't know much about the collaborative can spend more time on it. If you, turn, if you open the folder, the very first thing is our mission, core statement, and core values. We always lead this with, with this because we are a mission and vision driven organization. Um, we don't get any money directly from the state. We <laughs> work totally off grants, contracts, tuitions, our collaborations with districts. And so we have to be focused primarily on our mission and vision. That's what basically is important for us. And that has to do with working with families and kids placed at risk especially. So we try to provide leadership, support, and so on to that group of kids especially in our districts and, our, and statewide as well. Behind that statement is our five-year strategic plan. And we hit the highlights of it, which is important to what I just said. So th this is really our kind of the four corners of, of our work. The first one is to serve member district needs. So as a member district, we see that's, that's our priority. And I find out a lot from Dr. Provost, from Larry Fallon, from our meetings with your curriculum directors and principals about needs, and we try to meet those where we can. That's our, that's our goal. We were set up as a collaborative for that purpose, and in Western Mass, I think we even more play a purpose because we have a lot of small and rural districts who by themselves can't do things that they can do collectively. And so we are able to serve districts and do things they wouldn't be able to do otherwise, like PD, special education services, and so on. The second of our goals is uh, direct service to kids. So we have special education programs, we have academy, we have after school programs, alternative education, early childhood, a whole range of programs directly with children, youth, and families. And the third goal is to develop exemplary educators. We do a lot of PD, a lot of licensure programs. Them takes part in a lot of those things. And that's another part of our major goals. And lastly, it has to do with innovation. So we see ourselves as an important role, working with our districts, our superintendents, and our school committees, our teachers, and so on, on promoting innovation for our schools to try to help the schools meet the emerging needs of our young people as we enter the 21st and a half century. I don't know what they call it anymore, but something like that. Behind that is this pamphlet, Services Overview. And I won't go through this, but just to say that this lists all the different services that we provide in different categories special education, et cetera. We also do corporate purchasing. Um, we have a number of different consortiums. You can read this more carefully. A lot of you know what we do. But I think the better way to talk about it is the next colorful piece of paper, which is a colorful grid. So on the left-hand side of the grid, one side is Franklin County, one side is Hampshire County. Hampshire County should be facing it. The left side of the grid are all our different major services. And then we put X's next to be for each district each service a district is using. And Northampton, I think, has just passed the fold. And if you look at Northampton and look at the list of services, you can see Northampton takes part in an awful lot of what we do and have has for many, many years. 
a major supporter and also a major user of our services. So between special education, professional development, um, we help with grant writing development in terms of the Title III consortium, cooperative purchasing, we do a whole range of kinds of things with Northampton. We're really proud and pleased with the, with the uh, partnership we have. Moving quickly here, behind that is a brown or buff which then digs down a little bit deeper and says here's specifically the kinds of things in the past year, 18 months, that we've done with Northampton. The first page lists all the different professional development open enrollment that Northampton teachers or administrators took part in. So it lists the different ones and then says how many participate. So helping families support children as readers had six of your teachers involved in that. And so you can see a range of different things. We have a special focus, and you have a special focus, on ELL students, working with students in poverty, students in trauma, uh, looking at implicit bias. Those kinds of topics, I think, are near and dear to your hearts. And we work with you on providing PD to your teachers in those areas. We're lucky enough to have some really qualified and highly trained consultants who help do that work um, for you and for us. So that's one list. The next page, and list other services, and the first ones are the PD we provide on site. So John Provost will talk to me or to Andrew, or someone on staff and say, can you help us bring a consultant in to do some work with a certain number of teachers or a school? And in the past 18 months, these are different things we came on site to do. Again, similar topics, um, but also uh, we did some EL ELA assessment, we did some social education curriculum work, um, all, all within the schools for a set number of teachers. You also are currently participating in our Title III Consortium. That's the consortium that provides services and funding for PD for teachers who work with English language learners. Um, you don't quite have 100 English language learners in your district, and so we have a consortium of all the districts that don't have them. Uh, and uh, together we are able to draw down money from the state and from the federal government to provide those services. And it's co cooperative purchasing. Heck Academy in Northampton, you have, uh, we had 10 students from 2019 to the present, uh, five through August, three graduated, two others came back. Currently have three students, Heck Academy, which is on Pleasant Street in Northampton. We also have services like occupational therapy and itinerants and occupational therapy direct services. There you can see the contracts we have with the schools in that. You have one student at Mount Tom Academy, and a lot, some, some with early childhood. You have your own very sophisticated early childhood department, ECFC, but we do some coordination collaboration with them. Um, and connected activities, I'll point out, this is the grant we get from the Regional Employment Board to help support internships, job shadowing, and so on. And you have a lot of work going on here. So our guy has been able to work with you, provide some support for you, and also involve six of your students in what's called STEM at Work. We got a grant from, from the state to work with industries and students to get them inter paid internships. This past summer, there were six students, I believe it was six students, um, Yep, it says six. I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank. Okay, yes, six students. Thank you. <laughs> Who took part in internships and they earned $2,500 of each over six weeks. It was paid for by the employer. Our Spiffy Coalition, and many of you have heard that word and wondered what does that mean? It means Strategic Planning Initiative for Families and Youth. Also does a lot of work with you. I'll point out two things. One is we every two years do a uh, prevention needs assessment survey. You probably have seen results in the past if you've been uh, here for a couple of years. It's a sophisticated uh, survey that we do with most of the districts in Hampshire County. Done it for 14 years, so you have good longitudinal data, and it looks at the risk and preventative factors that are present for your eighth, tenth, and twelfth graders. So it helps give a measure of kind of where there are issues you might want to look at, where your strengths are, et cetera. This year we added questions about vacant, for example, didn't happen before, um, and some additional questions about bullying. All interesting results, and I think that they're arranging to do a presentation here soon. Am I correct, John? I'm not sure. Okay. You have results, and we'll work with you on getting that here. We've also been doing a lot of uh, work with Northampton on vaping prevention. So part of the list here includes that. The last part is about healthy families. I just, this is a longer explanation. You see a couple of very interesting projects. Our Healthy Family Coalition works with families and kids to make sure kids uh, have access to good food, um, have access to the kinds of activities and so on that will help support them in school. This is a program we have that's not in the school, but it helps the school. And the first of these is to work with community the communities develop community gardens, 
And the second one is to work with the communities to develop community farmers markets. We did a lot with Hampshire Heights. Um, your schools were active in this area. It's been a really interesting and, and good project supported by a couple of foundations. So a lot of these things I mentioned are actually free to Northampton because we have foundation or grant funding to support them. That's one more benefit we bring to, uh, to you guys. Uh, next thing is our list of our year, this year's PD. The last thing in your folder should be a postcard. Is that true? It doesn't have one. I included that because it's a really fun Facebook page. If you don't know about it, you might look at it. We launched this two and a half years ago when there was a referendum about charter schools. And our superintendents and our board talked about the fact that our small and rural districts don't have much of a voice. They have a very hard time getting their story out while the charter schools were, had money and they were getting their story out. Um, and so we developed this Facebook page for our member districts. It's really cool to get on and you'll see stuff from all the different districts. We, we steal stuff from your websites, or not steal, we ask for permission. It's really fun to see the amazing things going on in Western Mass. Such as a fun thing for you to be aware of. Any questions about the collaborative or our work with North? Okay. Then I assume in your packets you have the revised and amended collaborative agreement. Is that true? Yes, indeed. So basically, we're asking for a vote on this revised amendment. The primary reason for this is two new school districts, but there are a couple other changes as well. So I just want to quickly go through it, if you have it in front of you, and just show you what the changes are, because you're voting on all these changes. Just so you're aware of that. And don't. So the first um, part of it is the first, very first section includes Gateway Regional and Worthington as members. Second thing is, down below, the agreement based on two-thirds majority approval. This is a change that Desi allowed. It previously said unanimous approval for the first time we passed this. And they allow us now two-thirds approval for amendment, which is a lot easier lift given 36 member school districts. Um, the next change on the fourth page, I believe. On the fourth page, midway down, enlargement of board. Uh, it says, second line, number of members plus the commissioner's appointed liaison. That's new. Used to say that the, the uh, depart or commissioner would appoint a voting member to our board. So the idea was a board would a member would come to our board and be voting, which was not necessarily appealing to us for many reasons. And also, they couldn't pull it off. They didn't have enough people. And so it's changed to a liaison. We have a liaison at DESE, very, very strong and supportive. That's the third change. The fourth change is on page nine. Same change happening twice, and this is an important one to be aware of. Previously, uh, our articles, our agreement, said that we would charge member districts basically the rate it costs us to do things and charge non-member districts a 20% surcharge, up to 20% surcharge. And this basically makes of course, membership helpful to you guys, but also helps subsidize and, and subsidize the services we do from non-members on behalf of members. It's we, about half of our business come from non-members. So it really is an important uh, contribution to the overall effort of the collaborative. And this raised it 5%. As he said, we could. And you're voting on increasing that 5%. And I hope you can see that's to your benefit to do that. But that's also in the vote. And then lastly, at the very end, effectively the agreement um, states what that is. Worthington Gateway will be approved once it goes through this process and the uh, commissioner signs it. Um, so at this point, we are looking for a vote from the Hampton School Committee. Uh, I think you have probably had the vote on your agenda, do you? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. So, are any questions any, on that? Yeah, I was going to ask, are there any questions for, uh, for Bill about the changes to the agreement? Okay. Um, yes, Ms. Busanski. Well, thanks, first of all, for the very uh, you know comprehensive Overview and of what, fast <laughs> and fast, fast, but seem pretty. So I really do appreciate all the work that you do, and and you know, and I think there's so many parts to what you do that sometimes it's easy to forget all the different parts. So it's nice to have a quick reminder. I'm just kind of curious. Um, you know, my my gut is to vote yes on this. I can't, uh, I, but I'm not sure I really understand the implications for our school district. I don't know maybe Laura does or beyond just including two more school districts sounds right. like it's a bigger collaborative sounds positive but it, it, it really doesn't affect 
The only effect it has on your school committee is there's a little bit more money subsidizing your work with us with 5%. Right. Two new members really has little effect. We'll have new, two superintendents coming to superintendent meetings. You'll have more input, two more people on our board. Um, all those are good things, but in terms of yep. fiscal or programmatic impact, it, if anything, will be positive. There'll be more people involved with our efforts. Thanks, so, that's what I thought. Can I just ask a question, Bill, yes. for informational purposes? So, um, um, was Gateway a member before? They were. And so Worthington got out of the Gateway district. Mm -hmm. So Worthington right. petitioned. So basically, you're kind of amending the agreement for the newly reformatted Gateway district, and now Worthington, which is a standalone district. So it's sort Close of- Close to that. Okay. So uh, Gate Gateway actually left the collateral before that split happened. Okay. Um, so they already were not members. Got it. And now want to become members again. Okay. So now they've they've split and now they both want to be Correct. members. Okay. So Gate so Worthington had been a member through its affiliation with Gateway, but then they had left and now Gateway wants to come back and they both want to come back. So. Right. Exactly. Okay. Just curious. It's it's tricky. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions about the agreement? Um, is there a motion, uh, Ms. Fallon? Do you want to make a motion to? Sure. Um, move to approve uh, membership of Gateway Regional and Worthington Public Schools in the Collaborative for Educational Services. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Was there a s yes? Okay, a second by Mr. Moore. Is there any uh, further discussion? Oh, yeah. Are, are we approving everything else too? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so, so, so do we need to motion B and and other changes or um, and amend the uh, what would I call it? What does it say? Except the yeah. The collaborative except the collaborative agreement as amended. Yes. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. It includes all of them. Exactly. Okay. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Excellent. <laughs> okay. <laughs> He's not waiting for the not waiting for the ink to dry on this one. Sign. Thank you. And today is the thirteenth. Fourteenth. Oh my gosh. I'm yeah. just I guess it is. Okay. So. Would it be okay to ask a question about the collaborative? Sure. I know, you, I know you asked, and I totally fine. Yeah. A little behind, but yeah. Thank you. That was, I really enjoy um, seeing everything that you do. And the question I have is, we've had just a lot of discussion in our district over the last couple months about vaping. I'd say it started with the students bringing it to us, and since you mentioned it, my question is just that you have this perspective across so many different districts, and they're all struggling with this really relatively new issue. Right. If you've come across any, I don't know, exceptional or visionary or unique things across all these districts that you think is helpful and um, that you can share with us. Definitely share that, those with you, showing Dr. Provost, yeah. So Amherst is doing a lot in that area and actually our Smithfield Coalition has worked with them to look at curriculum. Uh, another area is what kind of interventions, you, know, you don't do punitive interventions, you wanna have some kind of a progressive intervention, you don't, but what, what's, what's useful that way? What won't reinforce negative behavior. So we're working with them and working with other districts, and I'll be glad to, to talk to Dr. Provost more about that and share more information. Our, our co Smith Coalition has a lot of information about vaping, so that would be helpful. Okay. Any other questions for? You're probably running off to another school committee tonight, yeah. or no? Okay. <laughs> I know you've got a lot of ground to cover. I do. So, yeah. Thank you so much. This is this is whole mix. That's true. That's true. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so the um, next item on the agenda is a series of donations that we're accepting. Um, uh, actually, we the next three are all uh, leads. Uh, oops, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry about that. I've skipped over one. We actually have a vote. Sorry about that. Um, we have a vote. This is the transfer from out of district per, uh, to personnel account, um, and you received a sort of a summary document on that. And I'd recognize uh, uh, Dr. Plummer and Josh to give us a give us an update on that. Yeah, I'd like to give Josh a chance to summarize it, just because he's been working so closely with Leeds and um, this particular situation. So, here's Josh. Sure. Um, so there have been a number of changes in special education um, needs and services over the course of this fall at Leeds Elementary. 
Um, part of these changes are from a number of students who have moved into the district um, since September, as well as a number of students across grade levels who have been identified by their teams to need increased academic services um, and specialized instruction in areas such as reading, writing, and math. And so we are requesting a transfer of funds from our district tuition line, line fund, an additional ESP um, for special education as well as a special education teacher. Um, I've worked closely with both our special education teaching staff as well as our core team at LEAD, um, which is comprised of our school psychologist, um, our LEAD teacher, as well as our school adjustment counselor and other members of the community um, to really sort of look at all aspects, um, pre-K through grade five, around our students' needs. Um, and they have felt strongly, as do I, that the increase in these two positions would meet the needs of all students. Um, and address the concerns that we've identified. Um, are there any questions from the school committee about the uh, about the transfer, uh, Ms. Busansky? Um, I'm I'm glad to hear about this because we've heard a lot of concerns at public comment. We've received emails. I've talked to parents from Leeds, but I'm curious why um, it says specifically grades one, first, second, fourth, and fifth. When I've heard from multiple parents about concerns in grade in the third grade, so what is that? Can you explain that? Sure. Please? Um, so the students whose teams have identified a need of increase in academic services are in the grades, and who have moved into the district are in the grades right. listed in the memo. Um, what that has allowed us to do, the increase in staff will allow our tiered support specialists. Um, so that's Ms. Erickson as well as Ms. Schreiber to provide some of the support services that have been identified as needs in grade three. Um, additionally, it also provides a little bit more flexibility. So it's not just these two positions, it really was looking at the whole school. Um, and so different members of our current staff um, have also been identified for providing supports in grade three. Um, so for the purposes of these two specific positions, mm -hmm. it's those identified grades, Got it. but the impact for the whole school community would be felt from kindergarten through um, grade five. Right, Thank and you. just like any other special education position, things shift weekly, daily. So simply because a person's um, caseload is with a particular group of students one week doesn't mean that there won't be shifting in a, a grade level. We actually, I've mentioned this before, have a really flexible group of special education teachers at Leeds mm -hmm. who largely focus on one grade but have pretty specialized areas sometimes in other areas and will sort of um, trade cases if it works, if it's necessary for the whole building to uh, function differently. So at this point, that's where the focus will be. Other questions? I'm just going to follow up on that and partly thank you. I'm really glad to see this as well because we have been hearing from a lot of um, families about the situation at Leeds. And I guess my follow up question is just to get a better sense of once this is in place, what is the plan for making sure that there's adequate support, that this is enough, or what's the timeline for that and how you plan to assess it to make sure things are getting better for all of the kids? Um, so our we have two weekly meetings um, with lead staff. One is our core team, and then one is also our special education teachers. They call it their super special education <laughs> meeting. Um, and so weekly we review all students at the core team level um, across grades. It's not focused on special <laughs> education. It's focused on all students. Um, and then our special education teachers also meet to review um, their particular caseloads as well as different groups of students. And so we have met multiple times over the course of the past few weeks. Um, we've also added, which is not part of the memo, but I think it's important to identify too, um, we've shifted our um, BCBA or our behavior specialist support. Um, so it was, she was partially at Leeds and partially at NHS. And so we have shifted her to be solely at Leeds for three days a week. Um, and are using contracted services to support the high school. Um, and so that has been an area where the staff has felt very um, supported and felt like that has been a move in, mm -hmm. in the right direction. Um, and they all feel very strongly that this will be the right level of support for now. As uh, Dr. Plummer has mentioned, sort of needs shift on an ongoing basis. Um, but this allows us flexibility to, should something pop up, um, it should allow us enough flexibility to think about those contingencies as well. 
Are there any other uh, questions? Okay. Um, I would entertain then a motion to um, to make this transfer from out of district to personnel account. So moved. Okay. Second. Is there a second? Okay. There's been a motion um, made and seconded. Is there any other discussion about it? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you to Josh and Pam. Now we will talk about those three donations uh, from Leeds PTO. Um, and uh, uh, we have a, uh, the first is a, um, is a donation from the Leeds PTO. It's uh, $1,395 for the grade three field trip buses. Um, Ms. Lamica, did you want to speak to that? Sure. Uh, so there are three buses that they have paid for for that trip. So uh, it's 1395 for all three buses together. Is there a motion to accept that gift? So moved. Okay. Is there a second? second. Okay. So there's been a motion made and seconded to ex uh, gratefully accept this gift from the Leeds PTO of $1,395. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Um, next is a gift from Leeds PTO of $6,000 for the garden classroom. Ms. Lamica? So uh, the Leeds PTO again has stepped forward um, and is donating the money towards the garden expenses. Uh, it's a new program that the budget picked up this year and there were some additional needs that the school needed so they uh, previously had used some of their garden money. So the PTO stepped forward to provide them some more garden money to take place of that. Okay. Is there a motion to accept that gift? Motion to accept the Leeds PTO gift of $6,000 for the garden classroom. Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded. Um, all those in favor? Hey, did you have yes. a question? Yeah, could we? So when this, when the garden classrooms were moved to the individual school-based budgets, what was the expectation that it would cost? Like how so, much money was budgeted in each school? I can't remember. Uh, I don't have the budget figures in front of me, but I remember that when the decision was made, it was actually in, I think, three years before the grant. Um, from NEF ran out and I remember saying that the expectation was the next three years of growth that we were able to put in the school budgets would be consumed entirely by the school um, gardens um, and principals all made the decision that the school garden was that important to them that they were willing to basically do that so you know uh, the building based budgets have been growing at about three percent over the course of those years so it would have been about 9% from where it was when that decision was made. Cami might be able to give you the, the number in, in terms of dollars, and but in terms of percent, that's what it's about. So there um, are two components to the garden program. There's partially um, the stipend that the garden classroom coordinator would receive, and there's also contracted services that school sprouts, school sprouts um, would be receiving as well, and some supply money is included in that, but not a lot of supply money. Um, is basically what's in there. So leads, for instance, uh, the contracted service piece for this year was $5,030. Um, and each elementary school has their portion based on the size of their program. It just, I, I feel like we've made it, like the community values at the schools value it. And this seems like an awful lot of money for the PTO to, to put forward to it. So I'm just wondering, were we not budgeting enough? Or was this, I don't know what unforeseen expenses there were, but. Um, but I do hate that the PTO is having to pick up $6,000 towards the program that we said the district was going to pick up, that the schools mm -hmm. were going to pick up. So there was money budgeted for the school garden program for each of the schools. I can say that in the transition of leadership there, um, I think were some miscommunications about how the money was supposed to be spent, but I don't anticipate that. Um, that will require a large infusion of cash to leads in the upcoming year, just making sure the money that was earmarked for the school garden program gets actually spent for the school garden program. Okay. Um, okay, so um, we've had a motion made and seconded on the um, garden classroom gift from Leeds PTO. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? And then finally, we have a um, a uh, gift of $6,376 uh, from the uh, Leeds PTO for the Gibbs program. Um, Ms. Lampa, did 
Did you want to speak about that? Again, this is an annual event that P uh, Leeds PTO usually uh, does. It's a PTO Gives program, and they have various school items that they have um, teachers put forward, requests for items, and I believe the attached list was in your packet um, of things that were approved by the PTO to move forward, and those total were 6376 for various items. Is there a motion to accept that gift? Motion to accept the Leeds PTO Gives program gift of $6,376. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, any discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Um, thank you to Leeds PTO for those uh, generous gifts. Um, next, we have a vote on a donation from Smith College of 25 Dell Optiplex computers uh, valued at $5,000. Um, and I note that uh, Ms. McLaughlin is here to talk about those. Um, did you want to just quickly give us an overview of those? Yeah, just that it's, a, again, a donation from Smith. They kindly had a handful of PCs that they were um, looking to donate to us, and so we have some different opportunities with engineering and various other programs that we'd like to utilize them for. Okay. All right. Is there any questions for Ms. McLaughlin about those? How old are the computers? Just curious. Uh, off the top of my head, you know, I don't remember. I okay. think they're a couple years. Okay. Usually what happens is they cycle through their inventory and then we get, they're getting new ones and so we get what they um, feel like they're, they're good to move on. Okay. But definitely still work. Yeah, we looked, in, we looked into them and they're definitely ones that we're looking forward to reimaging with the Innovation Pathway students and uh, getting them put into different classrooms. Excellent. Okay. Is there a motion to accept that gift? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All right, so thank you. All those in favor of accepting the gift of the 25 computers from Smith College, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so thank you to Smith College for that gift. Next, we have a vote to approve uh, a, the surplus of a bus. Um, and I'll turn to Ms. Lamica to, uh, to explain this one. Sure. Um, so we have our fleet of buses, uh, the smaller size buses. We have one bus that we would like to um, dispose of probably within the next few months. It's a 1997 Chevy 20 passenger bus. Um, it is currently not operational. It's about 115,000 miles on it. Um, it's actually being stored at the DPW yard and is being used for storage. So. Our other buses have seats that come out of the bus to actually um, allow our wheelchair in. So those seats, when they're taken out, need to be stored somewhere. So at the moment, they're being stored in this other bus that's not operational. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware or not, but the DPW has got a, a project going right now. So they've asked us to relocate our buses out of the yard. So rather than try to tow this bus that's not operational somewhere, this is probably the time to dispose of it and we will find other storage capacity for those seats somewhere. The DPW is uh, building a new fuel depot, um, which is to replace an old underground storage fuel tank. And it's a fuel depot that serves city and schools and other departments. And so they're, they've got a massive project going on. So they're kind of right. limited for space. So, so and up to now, this is where our buses have stored overnight, including this one bus. So we've been looking to relocate and move some things around. So. And because it's real property, the, the school committee has to vote to Correct. actually surplus to allow you to actually dispose of it. So. Correct. And I don't expect to get more than $10,000 for it, but we do need the policy to go through, get the school committee's permission first, and then we'll go through the process of seeing if anyone has any use for it and get as much as we can for it. Yes. Uh, we, we, the city uses Municibid, which is like an online like yep. eBay for stuff, so, so there may be some takers on it. So. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the surplus of this bus? Motion to approve surplus of bus. Okay. Second. Okay. Any other questions or discussions about it? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So that is approved. <laughs> um, next, we'll move to a report of the Rules and Policy Subcommittee. Um, we have a number of um, uh, policies on both first reading and second reading. And I'll turn to the chair, Ms. Fallon. Thank you. Um, 
so for first readings, I don't, let me preface all this. Um, we were trying to systematically go through the entire policy manual, um, and we were in the midst, you had referred um, sections A and B to us. We we're working our way through A, and when I was reviewing B, I realized that there were dis some serious discrepancies um, in our policies on um, school committee organizational meeting, um, on school committee officers, and um, agenda format, um, where we don't have any, <laughs> we don't have alignment with um, our city charter, with our current practice, um, with the MASC recommended policy, and so we're not, we took these out of order. These are first readings, the two policies, BDA and BDB, and you will be seeing another policy from B. Um, just because I thought it was important for the sub for the full committee to realize that we have some questions about these and that I think it's important that we talk about it before the next show starts um, so that everybody can weigh in on it. Um, so um, the issues that came up, so for example, policy BDA, school committee organizational meeting, um, we did try to align this with the city charter, the original policy had um, at its, uh, let's see, we had at the first meeting of each calendar year that we were electing a vice chair, whereas the city charter um, and the MASC policy, I think, had its first regular meeting following the annual election, uh, following the elections. Um, and so those are the sorts of changes and discrepancies that we were trying to rectify. Um, so the policy that we were proposing is um, as soon as practicable, after the school committee members elect have been qualified following the regular city election, that wording is straight from the city charter, the school committee shall organize by electing of the persons elected as a member of the school committee to serve as school committee vice chair and adopt the procedure for the Northampton School Committee. The school committee vice chair shall provide and preside in the absence of the mayor. In the event the chair is not present, present the senior member years served will act as the chair pro tem. A majority of the members of the school committee will constitute a quorum. The election will proceed as follows. The chair will call for the election of the vice chair. The vice chair will be elected by a majority roll call vote of the members present and voting. If no nominee receives a majority vote, the election will be declared null and void and nominations will be reopened. The school committee shall annually appoint an executive secretary who should be under the direction and control of said committee and the compensation of such executive secretary, if any, shall be fixed by the school committee. A vacancy in the position of vice chair occurring between the organizational meetings will be filled by a member elected by the school committee. Following election of officers at its organizational meeting, the school committee may proceed into such regular or special business as scheduled on the agenda. Um, we had um, um, taken the vice chairperson shall appoint a parliamentarian and vice chairperson will act as the official spokesperson for the committee out um, because A, other policies address that, B, we vote on it when we do the rules of procedure um, and so it seemed prob problematic to have that listed in so many places and that's not actually our practice or MASC recommended policy so that was why we suggested removing that I'm sure this is going to generate a, yeah. I just wanted to point out, I, I think there's an omission in the second paragraph. I think it's supposed to say, in the event that the vice chair is not present, the senior member will take over. Yeah, that makes more sense. Maybe chair and vice right. chair. Maybe. Because up above it says, when the chair isn't present, then the vice chair takes over. Yeah, I think, so, that, I think that's supposed to say vice chair. Or chair and vice chair? Well, the, the sentence above says the school committee vice chair shall preside in the absence of the mayor, and then it says in the event the vice chair is not present, right. then the senior member. Right, but theoretically, so. you, the mayor is the chair, and this is the organizational meeting, meeting so there is no vice chair. And so, ah, okay. so that's what that was saying. Okay. Was that in the away. event that the that the chair, you, the mayor, is not there mm -hmm. to run the election of the yeah, vice the chair, the senior yeah. member would. Although, yeah. So I don't know if that would preclude. Well, that them. makes sense. That makes okay. sense. Yeah. Okay. Yes. In line with what you're just saying, then the sentence right above it: the school committee vice chair shall preside in the absence of the mayor should go away if there is no vice chair. Well, that's defining what they are. For the organizational meeting. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I think. I mean, I think. I think you either need to get rid of that sentence or say, in the event the chair or vice chair is not present, whichever. I don't know which it means, but. I may leave after the election. You know, who knows? <laughs> I'm um, out the door. So, Dr. Boss, I hope just you remember out. that for the second reading next month. Sure. Okay. okay. Um, and so then moving on to. Actually, one of the oh. Yeah. Do you want other comments on? Oh this? yeah, no, sure. You don't like. I know we tried to. Avoid I know because it twice, so <laughs> I don't know. Right. You know, but just to clarify that first sentence, I'm just a little confused by it. So that's saying that we will uh, elect that that organizational meeting will happen. Will be the first meeting of the new term with the new pe members. Mm -hmm. That is what that's saying. Yes. Okay. And that, that wording we took directly from the city charter. But why wouldn't we take it, why wouldn't we make it align with the rules of, the wording from the rules of procedure, which say the first meeting following an inauguration shall be an organizational meeting during which the school committee shall ABC. It seems to me like those two should align maybe more than well, so the, the city charter. Well, so the procedure should probably also align with the city charter because the city charter takes precedence over both of those things. Am I correct? Yeah, that's true. Um. So do you, you see what the where I was yes I yeah yeah before us because they're not all aligned. Mm -hmm. So I'm open to suggestions or changing mm -hmm. the wording for next as long as we have I guess agreement I'm, about whether it's per calendar year, which was I think our current policy, versus mm -hmm. after each election or the first meeting following an inauguration. Right. To me, that's the clearest. That's this, clear. as soon as practicable after the school committee members elect have been qualified, actually mm -hmm. seems kind of vague. Like who determines. Well, you get sworn in in January. Yeah. So yeah. Well, well, I know, I know what yeah. we would all think it would be yeah. or should be and has been, yeah. but it just seems a little more vague than the first meeting following an inauguration, which is in our rules of procedure, but we can that's debate it more next time, I guess. Right, okay. just yeah. a thought. And once again, I don't have strong preferences other than everything aligning. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> and one other thought, the paragraph about the executive secretary shall be annually appointed. Should we just make that a, you know, a two-year term to align with all the other appointments? Sorry, that's right below the... Right, no, I know where you're talking because I don't think we do annually appoint. Go ahead. So just, um, that is sort of perpetually given to the superintendent who right. delegates it to the clerk? Yes. But I just don't think we do it each year. We do it in our organizational meeting. So just the thought. To the term, yeah. Okay. Um, Laura, I yeah. didn't say this in my notes. In my initial notes for a meeting, um, and the chair will call for the election of the vice chair. Do you see that line? We, at one point, we also had the, the chair will call for the nomination and the election. So do you ask? And the, but the, I have a question mark by it. So well, I, for the election, we would I would open the floor to nomination. That's how the election would be yeah. just under. So just that's rules. fine. That's fine. Yeah, it's, I think that would be fine. Right. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Thank you. So policy BDB is school committee officers. Um, this is another one that wasn't entirely in line with our actual practice. Um, so we added in language, the mayor shall be a voting ex officio chairperson of the school committee as providing presiding officer at all meetings at the committee. The chairperson will have the same powers as any other member of the committee to vote upon all measures coming before it, to offer resolutions and to discuss questions. They'll perform those duties that are consistent with their office and those required by law, state regulations, and this committee. In carrying out these responsibilities, the chair will. Um, we did adopt this primarily from the MASC policy with a few changes. So we have um, signed the instruments, acts, and orders necessary to carry out state requirements in the middle of the committee. Um, consult with the superintendent. We added in the language and the vice chair because that's been our practice. Um, I did consult with the MASC and said, you don't include the vice chair in your policy. What are your thoughts? And they said, 
that while the MASC policies were, in their opinion, the best practices, that it, the most important thing to them was that our policy reflect what our pract what we were doing as a committee, our practice. Um, so we had consult with the superintendent and vice chair on the planning of the committee's agendas, confer with the superintendent on crucial matters that may occur between committee meetings, appoint subcommittees, uh, call special meetings if the committee is found necessary. Uh, we eliminated number six, um, and then be responsible for the orderly conduct of all committee meetings. Um, and as presiding officer at all meetings of the committee, the chair will call the meeting to order at the appointed time, announce the business to come before the committee in its proper order, enforce the committee's policies relating to the order of business and the conduct of meetings, recognize persons who desire to speak and protect the speaker as the floor from disturbance or interference, explain what the effect of a motion would be if this is not clear to members, restrict discussion to the question when a motion is before the committee, answer parliamentary inquiries, uh, put motions to a vote stating definitely and clearly the vote and result thereof. Uh, duties of the vice chair. The vice chair of the committee will act in the absence of the chair's presiding officer of the committee and will perform such other duties as may be delegated or assigned to them. Um, this was not <coughs> unanimous, but we did vote uh, to put it forth with recommendation. The vice chair will be public spokesperson for the committee at all times except as this responsibility is specifically delegated to others by the committee. Um, there was a question about whether we have the vice chair of the chair act as spokesperson for the committee. Um, the MASC policy has it as the chair. Our practice has been vice chair. Um, and I think that's going to be a topic for the committee. Um, I mean, typically we don't have the the spokesperson speaking for us without our all of us discussing it and agreeing on what they're going to say. Um, so I think that that'll be something that we just need to decide um, before January, so that we're all kind of clear on, or at, in January, um, so that everyone is clear on what our expectations are. Um, and then the clerk will keep or cause to be kept an accurate journal of all committee meetings, will comply with state law and committee policy regarding notification of meetings, and will render such reports as may be required by the state or the town. Um, and we also added in legal references and a reference to city charter article 4, which is the portion that deals with the school committee. Um, so those are first readings that will be coming before you for a vote. The only thing I was going to note, and I um, I can make it as an amendment next time or whatever, somebody can make it an amendment. I just think that um, in that opening sentence, um, we should really you should really just use the term chair um, instead of chairperson because you use chairperson, chairperson, and then later in the paragraph it turns into chair, and then the rest of the meeting, the rest of the thing, it's chair. Um, and the charter is specific; there will be a chair and a vice chair. So just to kind of make it consistent, it should probably just say chair. I know what you're trying to do by saying chairperson, but I think chair is also equally non, you know, um, you know, gender related. So, but just to be consistent. Thank you. I just have a quick question. Um, whenever I've seen these, we, they're always dated, and we've had past policies. And I'm just curious: do we not have a past one? It looks like this doesn't have a former date for Northampton and maybe it's coming from MASC. I'm just curious why it looks so. So the reason, yes, yeah. so that's exactly what happened. So we do have a policy and it was dated um, it was dated 2003. But when we amended it, we found that we were aligning more with the MASC policy and so we took theirs and then made changes to theirs. And they are not dating their policies anymore um, because it's a reference manual. So our current policy exists. It's yes. all these things, but it's not what we're looking at. And then so obviously the treasure stuff would go away and we'd put a new date on it. Right. Okay. Yeah. Although then, yeah. So the note, we were uncertain whether or not we should include it because when they add a note it's usually for informational purposes um, we weren't sure whether or not we should keep that and we're open to suggestion um, they added further notes about on, on the if you guys want to look at the MASC policy there were further notes about how city charters often address this topic and you should add a reference to pertinent sections of the charter as a legal reference and how you could combine documents um, combine policies um, so 
Yeah, you can always, all of you have access or should have access to the MASC policy, the online reference manual. Um, and all of our policies are on the Northampton Schools website under school committee policies. So if you ever want to compare them side by side. Um, okay, so those are first, yeah. So if we want to see the, the B, policy BDB that we now have, we can just look yeah, at our then, then you're Northampton, Northampton policies. Schools, okay. Under school committee drop down, there's a, all of our policies Got are it. on that. And then you would go to the MASC online reference manual to see theirs, and then you all have our hybrid that we're bringing forth as a recommendation. If you have trouble, just let me know and I'll send it to you guys. Um, so now we move on to second readings and votes. Um, we have first up policy AA, school district legal status. Um, there were minimal changes made to that policy. Um, it was, our policy was from 2003. It had been updated um, by the MASC. It was very similar. The only changes that we were recommending, um, I'll just read it since it's so short, is that the school district legal status, the legal basis for public education in the district is vested in the will of the people as expressed in the Constitution of Massachusetts and state statutes pertaining to education. Under the general laws of Massachusetts, Every town shall maintain a su sufficient number of schools for the instruction of all children who may legally attend a public school therein. The Northampton Public Schools are a department of the city of Northampton, operated under laws pertaining to education and under regulations of the Massachusetts Board of Education. The area served by the Northampton Public Schools is coterminous with the city of Northampton. Um, and there are cross-references, legal references, and um, the historical note. So I'd move to approve policy AA as amended. Second. Any discussion about policy AA? I just really wanted to appreciate that historical note. I don't think I've noticed us ever having a historical note on a policy before that Massachusetts is the oldest public school system in the nation, so. <laughs> I think Florence, I think, is the home to the first kindergarten in the United States. So there you go. Um, okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Moving on to AB. Uh, policy AB, where um, our policy is identical to the MASC policy. Um, Ours has not been reviewed since it was adopted in 2003, and that was part of what we wanted to do is review our policy systematically. So we're not recommending any changes um, to the policy. I would move that we um, accept policy AB as presented. So. so this is a motion to approve the policy uh, as is, right, with mm -hmm. no changes, okay. All those in favor of that? Can we make a comment? Sure, please, yeah. So. Um, I'm not sure I'm not in favor of it, but it just struck me reading it. One of the things here says maintain two-way communications with citizens of the community. And um, I understand why we have the kind of public comment we have. And I completely understand why we don't engage in back and forth in this kind of setting. But it just seems like since we're looking at this policy, it might be worth asking the question, are there ways that we could do better at maintaining two-way communication? And I don't know what that means, but it, it could mean having forums every once in a while on topics. Um, since I've been on the school committee, I don't feel like we've taken a topic that we've really discussed and, and felt like we had this two-way communication as often as might, the community might like. So I just, you know, I just put that out. I'm curious what people think. Yes, Ms. Psansky. I think it'd be interesting to have that as a retreat topic, maybe in maybe our January retreat. Sure. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay. All right. Any other uh, questions about policy A B? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, next, we have policy ACA, non-discrimination on the basis of sex. We also have not revised it since it was adopted in 2003. 
However, there are no changes and it is identical to the MASC policy, so I would recommend ad ad adopting it um, as presented with no changes. Is there a motion? Is that the oh, motion? Sorry, that would be my motion. I would okay, I'll second that. that. Okay, so there's been a motion made and seconded. Any discussion? Um, okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Uh, next up, we have policy um, AE. Um, oh, well, I was going by order of the agenda. Oh, okay. So AE is commitment to accomplishment. Um, this is another policy. I took the easy ones first. Um, that is identical to the MASC policy. There are no changes. Um, we have not looked at this policy since we adopted it in 2003, so it's just a way to get everyone to glance at it <laughs> at least once every 15 or 16 years. Um, so I would move to accept policy AE um, as presented with no changes. Second. Any discussion on this one? Okay. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Oppo any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, that one is approved. And then finally, um, we currently have policy ACB, um, non-discrimination on the basis of transgender and gender non-conforming status. The MASC um, does not maintain a policy on this. I think it's very really important that we, um, that we do. And I would move to approve policy ACB as presented. We've got a motion made and seconded. Are there any questions? Yeah, I do. Okay. Um, I know, um, down in the one place where we did have an amendment, I don't think that's right. Yeah. I'm confused by that. Yeah. No, I don't think so. It was basically that. Um, oh, yeah. It was for us, it, we, we had a long discussion, but that wasn't what we came out with. No, it wasn't. I'm sorry. Um, I didn't even notice that. It was, it was the responsibility for notifying the district, notifying the of, district. of a student's preferred gender identity. Yes. So I'm sorry. I would move to um, accept it with the following amendment. Any, do you see where we are? Yeah. Um, that the responsibility for notifying the district of the student's preferred gender identity rests with the student and or with the parent guardian. So a motion? Yeah. Second. Okay. So there's a motion made and seconded to make an amendment to the um, policy. Are there any questions about the amendment? Just to clarify the language. Hearing none, all those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so now we're back to the main motion um, to approve uh, policy ACB. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So, is there any further report from you, Rules and Policy Committee? Um, no, we'll be setting a date for the, the next policy meeting and hoping to bring forth more policies. <laughs> <laughs> there, you know, it's it's going to be it's okay. going to be a long time before we catch up. Okay. Okay. Well, we thank the committee for its work and and bringing those forward. Okay, so now we move into the um, uh, next phase of reports, and we have the business manager's report uh, as well as the personnel report. So in your packet is the fiscal 20 appropriation report through October 31st. Uh, there's a few areas that have deficits, um, namely this translator special education, the grounds contracted services, a number of uh, maintenance accounts. Um, vacation buyback. Um, I'll be reviewing those with administrators and the transfers will be in process and will be prepared um, and completed. Um, and I don't know if you have any questions on the financial report or I'll keep on going. Um, the gifts that we've accepted since our last meeting, we have one gift from the uh, Bridge Street PTO for $300 and also the JFK PTO for $750 were accepted by the superintendent. We had three warrants signed by your committee member that were included in the packet. And last 
for the personnel report, we have 11 new hires, one transfer, and six separations. Ms. Fallon. Can I just ask a question about the translators? Have we taken advantage of the collaboratives, the program for, is it Lexicate? Are we involved in that? I know that they had said that their members could get a five to 10% discount depending on Depending on the translation piece we need. Um, right. Sometimes we need the translators at meetings and things, Dr. Provost. I can also say that for most language, um, Transfluency, which is a current translator, is cheaper. Okay. So we're the most cost effective translation service. Thank you. And that's what I have. Okay. Any questions about the business uh, manager's report or the personnel report? Okay, hearing none, I'll turn to Dr. Provost for the superintendent's report. Thank you. As our two very important principal searches near conclusion, I'd like to extend my thanks to everyone who played a role in the process, starting with the members of this committee who served on search teams. Dr. Voss, who's a member of the high school search team, and Ms. Bizanski, who's on the Jackson Street team. Next, I'd like to thank the chairs of those searches, Leslie Wilson for the high school search, and the Jackson Street co-chairs, Nancy Cheevers and Kathy Malinowski. I'd also like to thank the members of the respective search committees. First, first for NHS, Henry Rivera Aguilis, a student, Eleanor Harden, a student, Lisa Leary, a teacher, Esther Locke, a teacher, Ryan Parent, teacher, Karen Hildalgo, counselor, Yamira Santos, clerk, Paula Regano Murray, ESP, Danielle Pedalaboard, parent, Mickey Buell, parent, Celeste Malvezzi, administrator, and Antonio Pagan, administrator. And now for Jackson Street, Brian Rodriguez, teacher, Kristen McHugh, teacher, Maria Vega, clerk, Lama Maynard, parent, Felicia Santiago, parent, Ashley Miller, parent, Mark Morrison, the athletic director, Josh Dickinson, associate director of student services, and Lily Pastor, ESP. Um, the charge that I gave both of the, the chairs, or all three of the chairs of the search committees, was to form diverse search teams um, that were diverse, not only in terms of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, but also in terms of the different walks of life that um, principals have contact with and I think they did a very excellent job putting together those teams. I'd also like to thank all of those who participated in the various forums held yesterday for the two high school finalists, Ted McCarthy and Lori Valancourt. We collected 183 feedback sheets on the two candidates and 139 of those or 76 percent gave candidates rankings of very good or excellent. This speaks to the work done by the search committee. I would say there's broad agreement that it put forth two high quality candidates. Another indication of the quality of the candidates are the unsolicited recommendations that have been coming into my bail, mailbox and some of your mailboxes today um, from those who have known the candidates as parents, students, and colleagues. These are obviously two educators who have touched many people's lives in a positive way. Wading through the written comments will take some time as I'm sure you can imagine, there are many comments on 183 forms, but I assure you that all comments will be read carefully and considered as I determine who's the right person for the job. Next Monday, we'll repeat the process at Jackson Street Elementary School. The two finalists who were announced in a telephone call that went out at the start of this meeting are Mary, Mary Ann Bartlett, Assistant Director and Fifth Grade Teacher of Nantucket Lighthouse School, and Walter Huston, Principal in the Southampton, in Southampton, New Hampshire, School District, SAU 21. Um, we will have forums for them Monday, November 18th, from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. in the Jackson Street School Cafeteria. A half hour session with each candidate will be facilitated by Albert Moussad, Leadership and Instructional Continuous Improvement Specialist at the Collaborative for Educational Services, so another CES service that we are partaking of. Spanish language interpretation will be provided and child care will be provided by NHS students. I encourage the community to come out and meet the candidates and offer me their impressions this Monday. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that report, uh, Dr. Provost. 
Um, in terms of future business and meeting dates, we have the school committee uh, meeting uh, with the student advisory committee next Thursday, December 12th, uh, 2019 at 6.15 p.m. here in the JFK community room. Um, and that's the only future uh, business and meeting date left for the term. Um, and then the final item on the agenda is adjournment, and I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion. <laughs> so there's been a motion made and seconded to adjourn. That's a non-debatable motion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, any abstentions? So the November 14th, 2019 meeting of the Northampton School Committee is adjourned.